Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another webinar hosted by the National Institute for Occupational Health, um, Ashraf Reikler, the National um, Occupational Safety Training Manager. And uh, our topic today is the triple burden of COVID-19, HIV and TB in the workplace. And we've got three distinguished uh, presenters to assist us with our webinar today. But with no further ado, I'm handing over you to Dr. Tanusha Singh, who will do the welcome on our behalf. Over to you, Tanusha. Thank you very much, Ashraf. Uh, good morning, participants, colleagues, and friends. A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the National Institute for Occupational Health, a division of the National Health Laboratory Services, and on behalf of our acting executive director, Dr. Muzi Zungu, who also happens to be one of our presenters today. A very special welcome to our distinguished guest speakers, Mr. Simpiwe Mabele from the International Labour Organization and Dr. Irene Mampa from the Impala Platinum Mines. It is indeed an honor and privilege to have you on the webinar today, sharing your exp expertise with us. Thank you so much for that. Um, we know that HIV and TB has been a public health and occupational health concern for decades, and the emergence of COVID-19 and its impact on public health services in general and on HIV and TB services has certainly compounded the health challenges faced by countries. And these challenges certainly will impact on the workplace and the extent of which, well, we will hear that from our panel of experts today. Colleagues, all our speakers are extremely knowledgeable on the topic, so do take advantage of the time and ask all those difficult questions that have been brewing. Before I hand over um, back to Ashraf, I'd like to thank our organizing team at NRH for coordinating this webinar. It is an extensive team, so I won't mention any individual names in the interest of time, but know that we really uh, and greatly uh, appreciate your efforts uh, in ensuring the dissemination of valuable information to all. To everyone for joining in, thank you so much once again for making the time to engage in the session and may you continue to be ambassadors and advocates of healthy and safe workplaces. Do stay safe and back to you Ashraf. Thank you very much, uh, Tanusha. That was Dr. Tanusha Singh, the uh, head of our COVID-19 Occupational Outbreak Response Team at the NIOH, and as well as the head of section of our Immunology and Microbiology section. Um, so the topics that we're covering today, uh, you've seen in the program, and I'll just briefly repeat them, with our first uh, presenter, uh, Simpiwe Mabele, uh, from the International Labour Organization. Uh, you will be covering the impact of COVID-19 on HIV, TB in the workplace, global and regional aspects. That's followed by Dr. Irene Mampa from Implala Platinum Mine and Dr. Mpampa, sorry, Mampa, as is dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on HIV and TB clinical aspects and particular case studies that uh, she will be sharing with us. And then a third presenter is our current acting executive director of the National Institute for Occupational Health, and that's Dr. Mzumkulu Zungu, um, who also heads our HIV and TB in the workplace uh, unit within the NIH. Uh, uh, Dr. Zungu will be dealing with occupational services for COVID-19, HIV and TB, the South African experience. And so with not much further ado, I'm going to ask Sampiwe just to prepare to share his screen as well as to open his microphone and by means of introduction, um, Sampiwe Mabele is, uh, as mentioned, um, at the offices of the International Labour Office, the ILO as it's commonly known, and he's a technical specialist on health, HIV and TB in the world of work for East and Southern Africa. Um, his duty station is here within South Africa, uh, in Pretoria, uh, covering the two uh, big regions within the continent. And his expertise is in the areas of education, legal and public health disciplines. And then just briefly in terms of his experience, he has a broad experience in management of training and development, design, planning and implementation of HIV and TB workplace strategies, proven success in developing training materials on HIV prevention strategies, and facilitating training workshops, expertise in managing and encouraging project teams to act, achieve goals and uh, objectives within this particular valuable field that we are talking about today and developed and implemented high impact value cost effective programs, 
highly skilled in providing coaching, guidance, training, and development practices to internal and external clients. Now, Sophia, I want to pause there because I'm about to go over to your professional qualities and strengths and academic credentials, but I think our audience might be upset if I read all of that. So I'm going to hand over to you immediately. And thank you very much for joining us today and sharing your wealth of experience and knowledge with us. I hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, thank you, Ashraf. I, I, I was actually reflecting on uh, the last time, or rather the first time we met, and I just realized that it was 20 years ago. And we did some work in, you know, around 19 uh, years uh, ago, uh, I think for over a period of two, three years. Uh, so it's good to see you again. I would like to greet one and all uh, in the webinar and uh, also to share uh, my gratitude uh, and how humble I am to have been invited to be part of this webinar. Um, I do have 15 slides, uh, Ashraf, but uh, 12 of those are the content that I want to share. So I am definitely not gonna waste any time, but I want to indicate that when I was invited, I, I, I was informed that uh, there will be two other speakers alongside me. And I really feel very humbled to once again, share the platform with Dr. Mamba, Mamba and uh, Dr. Zuma, uh, Zungu, sorry. I um, agreed to share some of the lessons we are learning as the ILO, not only because I was approached, um, I agreed because I really appreciate the fact that um, NIOH is creating the balance between the clinical aspects and the socioeconomic aspects of HIV, TB, and COVID-19. So it's, it's really a, a subject that I resonate with where we don't necessarily have to um, focus on clinical aspects because we are clinicians. We don't have to focus on the economic aspects because we are economists, uh, neither uh, uh, to focus on social aspects because we are social scientists. I noticed at some point that there's about 266 people, including the panelists. And I have no doubt that there are people who are clinicians, who are economists, who are social scientists, uh, but the program really is creating the balance. So I really would like you to open your ears, uh, even from the part that I'll be talking about, because it's focusing on socioeconomic aspects of the triple burden of uh, these uh, epidemics. Uh, Ashraf, can you confirm whether my screen is uh, showing? Yes, I can see the full slide. It's your first slide and it covers the full screen. It's maximized, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Just maybe to quickly reflect on what I'll be talking about. Um, I'll, I'll just introduce, uh, uh, introduce and give a little background in terms of my uh, messages today. Uh, but I also would like to quickly define, without using a dictionary type or an academic definition, I'd like to define and locate the world of work. Um, I also would want to share some observations and lessons we are learning. Uh, I, I'm using this, you know, um, um, cautiously, uh, not lessons we have learned, but lessons we are learning, because this is in the context of COVID-19. And I will definitely be splitting this into two, the COVID, the impact of COVID-19 on HIV in the workplace and the COVID-19 on TB in the workplace. Then some quick recommendations and finally conclude by highlighting some areas of support. But in terms of my introduction, um, I know I was asked uh, to talk about the impact of COVID uh, on HIV and TB. But I do want to start broadly because this is what we deal with uh, in the ILO, the impact of COVID-19 in the world of work. And, and, and I was looking at literature and uh, documents that have been put together thus far uh, in line with what we do as the ILO. And I realized that uh, th there's quite a lot of thematic areas that the impact of COVID-19 cuts across. One is gender equality and diversity. And this would include our um, indigenous peoples, for an example. It also has an impact on disability. 
impact on K economy and impact on HIV and TB, particularly in the world of work. And least but not least, uh, at last but not least, uh, it has an impact on violence and harassment. But I will limit my messages to the impact of COVID-19 on HIV and TB, particularly in the world of work. So when I looked at it, um, program director, I, I, I do agree with the notion of the triple burden of disease, uh, particularly in the world of work. And of course, we are in the era of COVID-19, uh, which really has created an unprecedented uh, uh, situation globally. Uh, so because I'm a visual person, so I looked at it uh, through this triangle. However, I want to assure you that I will limit my contribution to the world of work. Um, yes, which is commonly known as the, as the workplace. Now I will be using the term world of work because uh, it is more encompassing in the sense that when you talk of a workplace, people have this notion that you, are talk of an, you talk of an office, you know, uh, the, the desk, a chair, computer, and uh, you know, a swinging chair and cabinets and all of that. But when you talk of the world of work, you are talking of this environment where you can perform your duties, be it at home, be it at the airport, or wherever you'll be. And that is the world of work. And, and you, I think you can agree with me now that um, part of the impact of COVID-19 has allowed us to create the working environment in our homes. I mean, as you can see that I am at home as well. And I have created you know, a workspace uh, in, my, in my house. But what I want to highlight is what we have done as the ILO in terms of monitoring the impact uh, of COVID-19. We, we have created what we call ILO Monitor. And ILO Monitor is really about how countries are responding from a policy point of view in terms of uh, COVID-19. And this is divided into four areas where we actually are focusing on how best countries can stimulate the economy and jobs. Because right now we are seeing a decline in terms of uh, jobs or uh, employment uh, is really decreasing. Then another area is supporting enterprises, employment and incomes. Because people are losing jobs, they are losing incomes. So we, we are monitoring this uh, from various countries. Um, the third one is about protecting workers in the workplace. And this is really about returning to office in terms of are these offices or the spaces where people were working ready for uh, the, the return of employees or, or workers. And finally, using social dialogue uh, through governments, employers, and trade unions to find solutions uh, in dealing with COVID-19. Um, this I'll go very quickly because maybe some of you are familiar with these slides, especially those who have listened to my contributions, but I thought I would not leave this one out because this is how we would broadly define or locate the world of work without using an academic definition. And I do want to start by indicating that when we talk of the world of work, it's not limited to formal employment. It includes informal employment, it includes self-employment. So some people may be working on their own, some people may be working in informally. But it also has three categories where government is not only a policy maker, but government as an employer. And I am aware that South Africa is employing, for instance, one plus minus 1.3 million um, women and men in the public service. And, and I, I actually want to make a disclaimer program director at this point to say, I was cautioned not to talk about South Africa, uh, but I do want to indicate that I will mention South Africa just in passing and not necessarily to talk about uh, South Africa in my presentation. But the other category is the private sector and uh, lastly, civil society. And, 
and these categories are, are, are very organized, not, not only from an employer point of view, but also from a trade union point of view or a labor point of view. So it's very important to always consider that in the public sector, government as an employer engages with workers and their representatives, similarly to private sector, and this would be applicable to civil society as well. So I just want to quickly go through some of the observations and lessons we are learning. And I'm going to start with COVID-19 and HIV at work. One of the recent uh, publications that we have as the ILO is uh, a policy brief which we produced in June of this year. And, and we are highlighting here that the COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented health emergency that has led to a major social and economic crisis in a very short space of time. And it is adversely affecting over 37 million people living with HIV globally who are already disadvantaged by stigma, discrimination, and they are being marginalized in some cases. And many of these people, they include working women and men, but they have little or no access to social protection. Now, you and I will also agree that the majority of people living with HIV are of working age, whether they are working or not, but they are of working age. We, we also did some work with um, um, GNP Plus, the Global Network of People Living with HIV, where we looked at um, about nine countries and what we were looking at, we were looking at an employment situation of people with, uh, living with HIV in these selected countries. And I must admit, uh, Program Director, that yes, this was before COVID-19. Um, we already had a crisis where a high percentage of people living with HIV were engaged in the informal economy. And they were facing high levels of discrimination in employment and had high rates of unemployment as well. And also we note that almost 1.6 uh, uh, billion uh, people uh, who are working are in the informal economy. And the world has significantly been impacted by the lockdown measures. So you can imagine uh, how these workers who are in the informal economy were impacted and workers um, that are hardest hit um, in the informal economy are women because women are overrepresented when it comes to informal economy. But I want to also move now to COVID-19 and TB at work. I'm not sure how many of us are aware that uh, the, co the global TB report uh, has uh, been uh, published, uh, the 2020 uh, report. And it does highlight that health services, including national programs to combat TB, need to be actively engaged in ensuring an effective and rapid response to COVID-19, whilst ensuring that TB services are maintained. And it goes on in highlighting issues of prevention and human resources. But what I also found interesting uh, in the report is the fact that though in the four countries that account for 44% of global TB cases. And maybe let me anticipate program director, the question that I may be asked here, which are these four countries? It's India, Indonesia. Once again, I'll mention South Africa, not because I'm talking about South Africa, I'm just highlighting their four countries that account for 44% of global TB cases. And the last one is Philippines. So we have noted large drops in terms of the number of people diagnosed with TB in these countries between January and June 2020. Um, but COVID-19 pandemic remains a threat. But the report goes on by also highlighting the impact of livelihoods resulting from loss of income or unemployment, which could also increase the percentage of people with TB and their households facing catastrophic costs. So the picture may change in the current half of the year in terms of what was observed um, uh, during the earlier part of the year. And 
Therefore, the global number of TB deaths could increase by around 200,000 to 400,000 uh, uh, million in, um, uh, sorry, 200,000 to 400,000 in 2020 alone. And this means that uh, if there's a disruption in health services, definitely it, it, it would happen. But I also want to highlight that the economic impact of this pandemic is predicted to worsen at least in two of the key determinants of TB incidence. And that is the GDP per capita and the undernutrition. And these were there even before COVID-19, but uh, it seems like because now the impact has uh, expanded, it's likely that uh, will, the situation will worsen. I also want to highlight, uh, it's not a very new report, but it became relevant in terms of COVID-19 um, and HIV at work uh, and TB as well, where the employers are recognizing um, that TB is one of the most common HIV related diseases to affect their workers. It imposes many costs on businesses. And you may also agree with me because the TB strikes mostly individuals between the ages of 15 and 54 years. And those are the years when people are in their productive prime. So the disruptions are really focusing on um, workflow, reduces productivity and increases both direct costs, which are related to care and treatment and indirect costs, such as the replacement and retraining of workers. So without effective treatment, employees with TB will often spend months off work and that would be a huge uh, disruption. I swiftly move uh, to recommendations uh, and, and I'm just looking at my watch here, program director, I, I, I think I'm still within um, my, my, my allocated time. I, and I think I will be concluding um, within uh, the allocated time. But in terms of recommendations that we are highlighting and, and uh, as ILO, which I will give some examples now from the globe and East and Southern Africa region, which I cover. And once again, I, I commit that I will not uh, use any example from South Africa because I had agreed and committed that I won't touch South Africa. One of the recommendations we are making is to prevent discrimination and exclusion in the COVID-19 response so that we adhere to the principle of leaving no one behind. A quick example here in Uganda, the Federation of Uganda Employers and the National Organization of Trade Union, they signed a joint statement which calls for a comprehensive response to the COVID-19 measures. And this was a very significant document because immediately they decided to, to make it practical. We also recommend to gather evidence of the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 on people living with HIV. And we have examples that we've collected, Indonesia for an example, where the Indonesia AIDS Coalition and ILO have joined forces to conduct a rapid impact assessment of COVID-19 pandemic on people living with HIV. And this was focusing on livelihood support and accessing ART in remote areas. In Zambia, there's a joint UN initiative which involves ILO where we also are, are, are focusing on gender equality and the scope of assessment includes the impact of uh, um, COVID-19 on people living with HIV. There, there are many examples. I have China, I have Mozambique, I have Madagascar, where we have worked with the National AIDS Councils. And I'll, I'll share all these uh, with uh, the organizers so that you can have access to this information. We, we also recommend that jobs should be protected and income for people living with HIV and, and key populations. And we, we, we just have an example, uh, a wonderful example uh, in Zambia where we are supporting uh, as ILO an, an initiative um, where the network of people living with HIV will produce hand sanitizers which will be sold in workplaces. And the Zambia Federation of Employers has joined forces. They have created access uh, through their members 
so that the people living with HIV, once they have generated and produced these hand sanitizers, they can be sold uh, in their members. So these are some of the wonderful kind of examples. We have others in Nigeria as well. I would have highlighted in Mozambique, uh, but I just am wary of time. The other one is to protect health workers, strengthen occupational safety and health programs. And, and this is very key because it has to do also with ensuring that when workers are returning to work and we know that uh, the, the health workers were in the front line, even during the peak times of uh, the pandemic. And we, we have some examples where we worked uh, with the Ministry of Labor uh, in Indonesia, but they refer to it as Ministry of Manpower. And we developed occupational safety and health guidelines to ensure that we minimize um, in, in, in infection uh, of COVID-19. Then the recommendations move to expanding coverage of social protection to include people living with HIV, because we realize that some of the social protection measures, they are not sensitive to HIV, particularly li people living with HIV. We also recommend uh, continuation of uh, HIV prevention, testing, and treatment programs for workers and reinforce the COVID-19 response. Towards my conclusion, I also want to highlight uh, a message that we got from the executive director of Global Network of People Living with uh, HIV, Rico Gustav, who said, and I open quotes, COVID-19 is affecting people living with HIV globally. Many are not able to get their treatment and have lost livelihoods due to lockdowns. We are rising to these challenges. Please engage with us, I close quote. So this is a plea coming from uh, the network of people living with HIV at a global level, commonly known as GN+. I want to then uh, quickly reflect on some recommendations in terms of COVID-19 and TB in the workplace. There's a, a, a plea to improve social protection for patients that are affected by TB uh, by protecting their employment status. For example, through legislation to prevent dismissals from work, because if somebody is gonna be off work and there may be uh, issues that relate to dismissals or medical boarding, and these need to be prevented as well. Also to establish a more streamlined uh, claim mechanism for people uh, with TB to access um, unemployment benefits in collaboration with uh, national so social security funds. And I'm using this term uh, broadly. And we all aware that yes, TB is um, an, um, a recognized and listed as an occupationally acquired uh, disease. Also to explore collaboration with the labor and business sectors so that we can improve policies and services for people with TB, including mechanisms for protecting the employment status of those uh, uh, with TB. And we also recommend that instead of only locating TB programs under SDG3, which is on health, let us try to locate TB programs in the workplace within sustainable development goal number eight, which is about promoting sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth for full and productive employment and decent work for all. Program director, in my conclusion, I really would like us to join some of the UN programs that are currently being implemented. And those programs that are being implemented by other partners like NIOH in supporting country level COVID-19 responses. We also may want to focus on triple disease needs assessments analysis and targeted interventions. I know there might be fatigue when it comes to needs assessments, but remember we are faced with a very unprecedented situation 
And in order for us to come up with targeted interventions, we may want to conduct those needs assessment and analyze the situation. We also may have to respond to the needs of the ILO constituents. And when I say ILO constituents, I'm not referring to Simpiwe and my colleagues in the office. I'm referring to governments, employers, and trade unions. We need to respond to their needs rather than sitting in our offices and program because we think these are their needs. Let's engage them. Let's dialogue with them. Finally, I think we should have discussions around the support that NIOH and other partners, particularly their role post COVID-19 during what is called new and better normal because the modus operandi has changed and it's likely to be shocking to many of us. And on that note, I would like to thank you for your attention. Over to you, Program Director. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Sampiwe Mabele, the representative from the International Labour Organization. Uh, he's a technical specialist on health, HIV and TB in the world of work for East and the Southern African regions. Thank you very much, Sampiwe. Uh, Sampiwe dealt with the impact of COVID-19 on HIV and TB in the workplace, the global and regional aspects. Um, with not much ado, our next uh, guest presenter is Dr. Irene Mampa uh, from Impala Platinum Mine. And she has agreed to present to us on the impact of COVID-19 on HIV uh, and TB. Uh, certain clinical aspects that she's going to share with us. I thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Mampa, and encourage you in the meantime just to perhaps share your slide screen and by way of introduction whilst you do that. Um, so Dr. Irene Mampa, as I've mentioned, is um, stationed at the Impala Platinum Mine uh, as the clinical head um, there. And uh, a duty station is the Impala Mine Hospital in Rustenburg. Her experience involves clinical expertise in management and treatment of patients with HIV and TB. Uh, in 2004, implemented integrated wellness, or since 2004, implemented integrated wellness and TB programs at the Impala Mine Hospital, social and ethical board member at Impala, and health and safety and environment board member at Impala, member of the Health Professional Council, and MITHAC, an alternative member of the Mine Health and Safety Council Board. Uh, professional quality strengths, I may add, as leadership and training, operational efficiencies, and budget and cost management, coaching and mentoring, and academic, academic achievements uh, is the Diploma in HIV Treatment and Management and her MBBCH uh, at Wits University, and is enrolled for her diploma, I think, is that Master's uh, uh, Occupational Medicine. Uh, um, and health at UP. You just can correct me on the last one, but thank you very much for joining us, uh, Dr. Mamba. I hand over to you. I can see your, your slide is already there and you got full screen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashraf, and thank you very much to the NIOH and to Dr. Zungu for inviting me um, to be on this platform and to be able to share our experiences on treatment of our patients at Impala with you. Um, COVID-19 is actually quite new amongst all of us. And I think sharing, being on this platform and be able to share experiences allows all of us to learn and gain knowledge from one another. Um, just a background on Impala Mine, um, without much ado, we have about 40,000 employees that we cater for, which is about 30,000 uh, permanent and 10,000 contractor employees. We also cater for their dependents, which are their wives and children, which is about 17,000 lives and around 700 uh, pensioners. So in total, around 57,000 lives that we actually take care of. Um, as you know, Impala Mine is actually a deep mining a uh, level mining. It goes right down to around 2,000 meters underground. Um, let me just start with our COVID-19. Um, when COVID-19 started, I think we started seeing our numbers rise late May. And in total, we have diagnosed around 18, 000, uh, 1,889 1, people and recovered 
1,860 people. We have currently active cases around 13 cases. With this uh, COVID-19, and we have seen the patients that have come through, coming through with COVID-19 and HIV together were 214. But of those that actually had TB were six. If we look at our employees that actually have HIV and are on ART, we have 6,124 that are on treatment, on ART treatment. So without much ado, I'm going to go to our uh, presentation so that we can continue and go get right down into the clinical aspects of COVID-19 and HIV and TB. It's quite a difficult one for me to do, Professor Zungu, because I had to decide on how to approach this matter. And just by looking at it, I decided, all right, let me try and compare apples with apples. Let us look at HIV and we look at the blood indices. What do we normally do when we, when we assess an individual with HIV? We assess basically for the FVC, the UNE, the LFTs, albumin, we look at it, CRP, ESR, uh, interleukin-6, we hardly do. It is not one of those things that we normally do. D-dimer, yes, in some instances we might do it. And I'm going to elaborate as to why. But when you look at a patient who's got HIV, normally when they come to you, they're always fairly very, very ill. Some of them might actually even be so emaciated with quite a loss of weight of greater than 10% of their body weight. And what do we do? We look at the HB on the FVC and the MCV. Most of the time they're low and we then assume, okay, they have anemia of chronic disorders. But what does anemia of chronic disorders mean to us as clinicians? It basically means that you must go and look and find out whether that individual does not have any other chronic illness, meaning TB, meaning cancer, something else might be happening in the body of that individual. We look at the platelets. Sometimes the platelets might be low, indicating that that individual has either idiopathic thrombocytopenic uh, purpura. We look at the whole differential count. Sometimes they tend to have a pancytopenia. The UNE, initially, most of the clients that you assess for treatment or for our treatment, when you assess them initially, the GFRs are always a little bit on the lower side. It could be less than 60, hardly less than 50. But sometimes in very compromised individuals with CD4 count, CD4 count of less than 100, we do have, we do see a GFR ranging just below 50. But also we know with the fixed dose combination treatment that we give to our patients, especially Tenofovir, it does affect our kid, the patient's kidneys. So we know that the GFR will be low to about less than 50, but not in all of them, in some of them. When we look at the LFT, we sometimes find that the ALP is raised and the gamma GT is raised, including ALT and AST sometimes LDH, but not as much as often. Because of the, our, I mean, our employees at Impala, and I haven't looked at the general population, but at our population at Impala, what you normally see is that the arguments are low and the argument will be ranging between 13 and 14 on initial presentation. And that is basically attributed to the diet that the people eat. Um, they tend to eat uh, the normal carbohydrates with the vegetables and less and less of protein. The CRP might be normal or it might be high. Now, CRP is an indicator of actually, uh, inflam is an inflammatory indicator, or it can actually also indicate whether an individual has infection. The ESR, we tend to do a lot, especially if we suspect TB, that we always expect it to be high. But interleukin-6, like I said, yeah, not so much, but it is also an inflammatory remarker. We don't really assess it when it comes to HIV positive patients. D-dima, yes, if you have a patient presenting to you uh, with a swollen leg, you would 
uh, suspect that they might have a DVT. And as we know, HIV does cause HIV vasculitis. So that high clinical suspicion has always been there in HIV positive patients that they might actually eventually have a thrombus or thrombocytosis, such type of a thing. The CD4 count range could be below a range between 100 and 200, of which some individuals can present with much higher CD4 counts. But we all know that virological resistance means a log value of of, of equals to three or less, or basically equals to three or higher than three. When we look at COVID, COVID then comes more or less with the same picture. And if you look at COVID-19, when you look at the FEC, they normally have a lymphopenia, which is a sign that they have COVID. Sometimes in the very severe stages or severe form of COVID-19, they will then have low platelets. And they normally say that once they start having low platelets, it means that their prognosis is actually getting very, very poor. Their GFR might be normal, or it might actually still be less than 50. LFT, the indicator there is a high LDH. Says mm -mm, you must be suspicious, there might be COVID. Albumin, not so much. But in most of the patients that we have seen, the albumin has been low, ranging between 13 still. And we do know that normal level of albumin is between, I think, is, is about the, the highest normal being 35. So 15 is actually quite, quite, quite low. The CRP is actually always raised in a COVID positive patients. And CRP tends to go together with the IL-6. The minute the CRP increases to greater than 33 and the interleukin-6 increases to greater than 73, we know in COVID patients that there is what we call a cyto cytokine storm brewing in that patient. Now, a cytokine storm in COVID, what does that mean? In COVID-positive patients, they tend to have a very severe cytokine storm, which is um, a release of cytokines, tumor necrosis factor, IL-6, IL-5, which then target the body. And IL-6 is the worst of them all because what it does, it causes multi-organ failure. And that is the one that we actually always look, look out for. And what do we mean by multi-organ failure? Meaning you can go into liver failure, heart failure, respiratory failure. So the minute the IL-6 is high, it means that your patient and your CRP, and, and because IL-6 tends to go together with the CRP, it means that your patient is at risk of getting severe respiratory distress. The LDH is always high. D-dimer uh, normally ranges between 0 0.50, which is normal, 0 to 0 0.50 is normal. In most instances, it's, especially when they're COVID positive, is greater than 1.50. And when the D-dimer is elevated greater than 1.50, they normally say it's actually also a poor prognostic factor. CD4 count, we hardly do it. But in one of my patients that I've treated who was a normal individual HIV negative, and they had the, the most severe form of COVID with low platelets uh, ranging between 22 and 25, the CD4 count dropped right down to 126 at that moment in time. But he soon recovered and he's actually up and about. So how does um, COVID present to us? How do these patients present to us who are COVID positive with TB and HIV? They tend to present with a pneumonia. They come through with pneumonia. So what do you do? You obviously patient who comes in with pneumonia who are HIV positive, you will then do a TB PCR because it's important for you to exclude TB. And you will also do TB PCR, TB culture. You'll also do a lamb test if the, if the CD4 count is less than 50 or probably a biopsy. And you ask me why a biopsy and I have a very interesting case towards the end that I will present to you with a about information on why we actually did a biopsy on that patient, a sputum MCNS and a funky tail. Sputum MCNS, because not all that looks like TB is TB on the lungs. It could be Klebsiella pneumonia, it could be any other infection 
especially when they have HIV and COVID. Fangitel, I highlighted it in red. Most of the patients that die basically from COVID, you will find that they, are, they do actually have TB, but if you don't monitor whether they have a yeast infection or not, they will continue to be in severe respiratory distress and you will not be able to take them off the oxygen. Eventually, if you don't do blood cultures and you don't follow up on these patients and assess where their yeast infection is, they tend to die on you. We had one individual who actually had candida auris and it was cultured six weeks, four to six weeks post the initial diagnosis of COVID. So it's very important that in any pneumonia that comes through TB plus COVID, that is there, you must exclude a fungal infection and ensure that you treat the patient for it. We also do, they present with pneumonia, we do an esopharyngeal PCR test and we do a chest X-ray. Literature has said initially when I started reading about it, about COVID-19, they said, do not treat patients uh, look, uh, with x-rays when you are treating patients for COVID-19. But what we have seen when, our, when we admit patients into our hospital, we do the initial x-ray, it might look clear. Three to four days later, they will have that peripheral patchy consolidation of COVID-19 on the peripheral sides of the lungs. And then if you don't follow up on the x-ray, you will start seeing by the rapid deterioration, they will start having um, severe respiratory distress, a high increased respiratory rate. Their saturations will drop right up to 60. And then you're not following up with the x-ray. But when you repeat the x-ray, it will look completely white. And you will sometimes you'll see that they do have a lower lobe consolidation of either the right or the left lung. But, if you, but when you assess the x-ray, you are able to see uh, the progression as to is this individual getting worse? Is my treatment that I'm giving to the patient efficient or not? Do I have to check for another disease? And TB, the classic TB picture, uh, we know it is the, uh, the normal um, gone focus, but then on the lung, but sometimes it can present with patchy infiltrates or even a lower low patchy infiltrate type of a pneumonia in the lungs. So it's very important to look at the X-ray and follow up on the X-ray of that individual. We already spoke about anemia of chronic disorders to say that it gives us a high clinical suspicion. And we all know that if the CD4 count is less than 50 in actual fact, uh, we need to do a urine lamp test. And why is it that? Sometimes in a population of HIV positive patients, when you do the TB PCR, 30% of them, because of their compromised immunity, their immune level is so low that they are, are unable to amount any immune response. The PCR test comes back negative. That is why we still have the TB culture, which is the gold standard. But when they have very, very low CD4 count, especially a CD4 count of less than 50, when you do a lamb test, it actually comes back positive, but in not all, in all cases. But there and there comes where you, your clinical expertise will then follow, where you will then assess to see assess the chest x-ray, assess the, the temperature of that particular individual, a temperature of an individual who's HIV positive, and it soars right up to 40 degrees all the time, is TB until proven otherwise. And you wait for your TB culture. It's very important to know where your individual is, especially those who are on HIV treatment. Some of them might have defaulted that treatment in their log value, might be greater than three. We had an atypical presentation of TB linked to COVID infection, which is one of the presentations that I'm going to show you when we do case presentations on patients. Now on treatment, we must be wary of drug-drug interactions. We know very well that 
as we have spoken, some of the HIV drugs and um, program director, they actually do cause, um, you know, renal failure. And some patients on TB treatment together with HIV treatment, they might go into um, 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 liver failure. And we do know that there is an interaction with the intratrovinal treatment and rifampicin because of inhibition of the cytochrome P450, P where now, instead of using, uh, 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 where now you'll have to actually boost your, your protease inhibitor with Nove when you treat your patient. Now I know that we have moved to Dolutegrava and the fixed dose combinations uh, with Dolutegrava only composed of 50 milligram, which is a dose, one, one daily dose. But however, with TB, you have to give, give a BD dose of, of Dolutegrava, 50 milligram BD. What happens when you have a patient uh, with with um, liver injury and presence of TB, we know very well that we have to stagger the treatment. We will have to now stop. We won't give a combined refer for tablet. We will start with ethambutol, then move to INH, and then move to refina. And but within that movement, we will uh, assess the liver function test to see whether they're uh, increasing or going down. If ALT and ASC are increasing with a particular drug, you will have to stop that particular drug. But however, the experts uh, then say, well, you must watch out for PZA, pyrazinamide, because it is actually the most dangerous one when it comes to liver failure together with TB treatment, together with R treatment. We spoke about fungal infection. You have to correct the electrolyte and blood abnormalities and possibility of deferring R treatment. We know very well that when we suspect TB in an HIV positive patient, we don't, and especially a newly diagnosed HIV positive, we don't initiate treatment first by giving HIV treatment and then come with TB treatment because your patient will then eventually go into iris. So with all the uh, South African Clinical Associate guidelines, the Department of Health uh, uh, guidelines on HIV TB treatment, who guidelines on TB treatment guidelines, uh, and on HIV treatment guidelines, have always said that you must wait a period of about two weeks before you initiate um, our treatment when you have a patient whom you have started on TB treatment. At Impala, we tend to err on the safer side, meaning that um, I am one of those clinicians, to tell you the truth, a program director who does not like dealing with iris because the minute you, get, you, you have to treat a patient with immune reconstitution syndrome, and I think and most of the colleagues, and um, for some that don't know what that is, is that, um, you know, what happens is that when you start TB treatment and HIV treatment at the same time. That body, which is unable to amount an immune system, starts amounting an immune system. That TB that was lacking or hiding there now becomes awake. And when it starts becoming awake, it can actually get disseminated. The individual themselves, they don't have um, much immunity or resistance to fight against this uh, uh, I, I normally call it a tug of war between uh, TB starting to multiply as much as it can in the body, the treatment trying to fight it. So the individual, because the individual body is already weak by itself, they tend to uh, go deeper and deeper and end up being either in severe sepsis, the HP drops quite low, you have to now balance the, the, the hemoglobin and it's quite difficult to balance hemoglobin when an individual has got iris because you don't even know how to transfuse them. You have to transfuse them one liter over 24 hours. If you transfuse them quite rigorously, they might die under, under your treatment. So iris has never been one of those um, uh, wonderful, not really wonderful, but it has never been one of those conditions that clinicians, especially I, like treating when, when, when I have a patient with HIV and treatment. 
So we tend to err onto the safer side of initiating um, HIV treatment in a TB positive patients between four to six weeks. The minute you initiate TB treatment, what we have all, always seen at Impala is that even though the CD4 count is low, it actually starts to lift up. It increases by itself before you even initiate our treatment. And the individuals tend to improve. When you add HIV treatment, it becomes an added on bonus. And we do know that it is a crime not to treat an individual who's got TB and HIV, not to give him HIV treatment within a year because definitely they will not survive. So we try and make sure, we actually make sure that we start initiate treatment of HIV treatment while this is still on, on TB treatment. Let's go to case number one. I know I can talk forever. Case number one is an individual who is a known patient on HIV, on ART, with a CD4 count of 160 and a viral load of 2.35 who was diagnosed COVID-19 positive. He actually had been going privately outside to visit his doctor for about three weeks with symptoms of, of flu. And then eventually he realized he was unable to make it and he decided to come to our hospital facilities for assessment. On X-ray, when we assessed him, we realized that he actually had quite an enlarged heart and, and he had also a pericardial wrap if you listened with, the, with, the, with your stethoscope. And then we immediately said, mm -mm, HIV, with HIV, we always know that you can have TB and this is probably pericardial TB. We did a pericardial synthesis, which came back, the fluid, the ADA was elevated, showing us that he actually had TB. We also even referred him to the cardiologist to go and assess, um, uh, do a sauna for us to see whether he does see any fibrin, uh, fibrinogen um, along the lining of the, of the pericardium. On arrival, his HB was 10, his MCV was 84. MCV tends to go high in individuals that are actually um, compliant on our treatment. It's one of those indicators that will tell you my, my patient is drinking our treatment. We expect it to be between 100 and 110. His lymphocytes were low. His platelets were a little bit reactive, 452, maximum is around 250. And um, his ESR was 100. His um, interleukin-6 initially was um, 59.7. And you can actually safely see that the interleukin-6, uh, pardon me, I think I went, pardon me, pardon me. It's gonna go back. Oh. His, pardon me, his interleukin-6 uh, went right up to 169. Now the question there will say, but this patient is COVID-19 positive. Why wouldn't you give um, toxilidamib or acetamera? Now giving um, acetamera, acetamera has a side effect, toxilidamib. It basically decreases uh, an individual's immunity. And that is basically its function, it's not a side effect. Its function is to decrease the, 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 the immunity, to decrease the immune response. As, as it does that, it reduces that severe reaction uh, action of that cytokine storm. That is why we give acetamera. So now you could imagine now if you have a patient with TB and you give them acetamera, it means that you will decrease their immunity further along. And if you decrease their immunity further along, you run a huge risk of them getting disseminated TB, which is what you don't have. So in in patients that basically have TB and, and HIV and COVID together with a high interleukin-6, acetamera is not recommended. The other side effect of toxidemamib acetamera is that it can actually decrease the, 
the platelets. So we don't actually give it at all. You do have a choice if the condition of the, of the uh, patient is severe, you might consider um, to use remdesivir. I've actually only used it twice in patients. And um, I have seen it succeed in, in one patient who actually was HIV positive and, um, and uh, was in quite, actually quite a bad form, a bad state where I could not actually give acetamera. And acetamera, you give a stat dose and then you can only give it for four days. A stat dose 200 milligram and 100 milligram for four days. You, no, no, sorry, that is um, remdesivir. Remdesivir is a stat dose 200 milligram and 100 milligram daily for four days. You cannot give it more than that. So remdesivir in a sense is, um, you can use it only for a shorter period of time. If you lose it for longer, it, it, the condition of the patient somehow tends to worsen or it is said that it actually does not function. Uh, as good as you would have anticipated it to. There are some studies that they have used it for more than 14 days, but um, this was in ICU, but the prognosis of those patients uh, was not as good as it was seemed to have been. Now, if you look at this patient, the d dimer was actually quite shocking. And this is the picture that you normally see that their d dimers are actually either greater than uh, greater than five, they can go right up to 10. And the question there will be, how do you balance such a patient with such a high d -dama? If you look at the platelets, it's 452. And the platelets, at least they're sitting on the positive side. So in that aspect, in this aspect, with an HIV positive patient, you can actually treat them with a low molecular weight heparin glexane, or you can actually use actylase. We tend to use actylase as a very low dose in a continuous form, and it assists us in reducing our D-dimer. But however, if the platelets are low, you cannot use um, um, a low molecular weight heparin, because if you do that, sometimes some patients do develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And if, he, and if that happens, then if you use that low molecular weight heparin, that those platelets will continue to decrease. And you will run a risk of having low platelets, a patient being hypocoagulable at a higher risk of bleeding, and your patient can die because of that. Apologies, Dr. Mampa, just to say that we've got uh, about, say, three or four minutes left. Thanks. Okay. Um, the next patient is actually quite an interesting one. Similar presentation, HIV was had COVID and treated for COVID for more than um, three weeks. And um, after those three weeks, he actually presented to us and he was limping. And in that time, I actually thought that, no, he actually had a uh, either a clot because he had actually had previous um, COVID, but however, he was obese and we had prophylaxed him with um, um, Zarelto. It didn't make sense. So we sent him for a CT scan angiogram for that um, 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 of the legs to find out whether he does not have a DVT. In actual fact, he did not have a DVT. We did the urate and we did the rheumatoid factor, which in actual fact, urate was a slightly higher but it didn't make much sense. We then decided to do an X-ray of the particular foot and we found that he had lytic lesions in those cubot bones, queried osteosarcoma. Did X-rays of the long bones? No, there was none significant there. But however, the biopsy, and this one is very interesting, the biopsy came back as MDR, TB MDR, multidrug resistant TB, of the foot. This is the atypical presentation of COVID. The next patient, very quickly, um, is a patient who came in newly diagnosed of HIV. And this is a trend that we're seeing. Out of the six, I have newly diagnosed employee, I mean, patients with very, very low CD4 counts and a very high viral load. The same presentation with TB. You, in, you normally treat 
your patients with TB and then balance your patient, make sure that you restore the sepsis, you treat the patient in general for the medical condition that they've had, which is everything I've said on top uh, previously. And then you will only initiate art later as we normally treat our patients. Now, there are long-term effects, and this is very important, I didn't, I didn't wanna miss this one, that literature in this literature that they have been presenting is that they do say that there's a convalescent period of about two to six months. If you repeat the x-rays of those individuals that have had TB or even normal COVID, you'll find out that those that had severe respiratory distress, some of them tend to have lung fibrosis. So what we have moved to is we have moved to uh, putting all those employees, which are our patients on INH prophylaxis to prevent them from developing TB because we know that they're actually at risk going on forward. Thank you. And this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mampa. And that was Dr. Irene Mampa from Impala Platinum Mine. And uh, Dr. Mampa has dealt with the uh, topic of impact of COVID-19 on HIV and TB, uh, clinical aspects, and she shared a number of key uh, cases there. I'm going to ask you, Dr. Mampa, just to unshare your screen um, while I ask uh, Dr. Zungu uh, just to prepare to share his presentation slides. Um, and by way of introduction, um, I want to then just uh, introduce Dr. Zungu very briefly. I must start off by saying Dr. Zungu is our current acting executive director of the National Institute for Occupational Health. And I think it's the second um, stint that he has uh, played the leadership role here at the NIH. Uh, but furthermore, Dr. Zungu is a public health medicine specialist. With further training and practice in occupational health, he's a member of the National Sorry, Occupational Health and Safety COVID-19 Committee under the National Department of Health and um, uh, the academic and technical coordinator for that committee. Uh, he's a joint appointment at the National Institute for Occupational Health, a division of the National Health Laboratory Services and the School of Health Systems and Public Health of the University of Pretoria. And with that, too short and very brief introduction. I hand you over to Dr. Zungu. Thank you, Dr. Zungu. Thank you, um, uh, Program Director Ashraf. And uh, thank you to the colleagues who spoke before me. I think they did a sterling job. It's gonna be a mammoth task to speak after them. I should have asked to speak first, but uh, um, we'll try and go as quickly as we can so that we can stay on time. Um, I'm gonna switch off my video. And, and just concentrate on the um, um, presentation so that uh, I'm able to focus. Um, I am going to talk to everyone specifically around the issue of what then do we do in the workplace? And what is it that us as occupational health and safety professionals, among others in the group, um, need to expect that the workers will want to see when they are in the workplace as far as uh, occupational health is concerned. Um, so please bear with me because it's quite a, 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 a slightly um, longish session, but uh, it's important that we go through everything. Um, so what we are hoping to cover is to is that we are going to introduce the basic structure of occupational health services for COVID-19 that will cover both uh, HIV and TB as well. But we also want to discuss the role of the workplace during this time of COVID-19 as far as it relates to the triple burden of COVID-19, HIV and TB. So before we go very far, I think it's important for us to talk about why should we bother thinking about uh, this triple burden in the workplace? I mean, we are in the workplace because uh, we are there to produce a product that will probably sell to our clients and probably to be meaningful uh, uh, for us to be concentrating on something that is the core business. Um, and we are not going to be able to convince management that uh, they should be paying attention to this diseases 
um, uh, during especially this time when resources are, are of a very high priority and in shortage. We find that um, um, a study published in the Lancet recently pronounced that um, during this time, the pandemic of COVID and the actions associated with uh, responding to the pandemic are going to have far reaching consequences, not only uh, in the workplace, but uh, even outside the workplace. And, 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 and these consequences will include um, the effect that is going to be on diseases, particularly HIV and TB, but there's going to be issues related to poverty, food security, and economic growth, which Simpiwe dealt with, which I'm not gonna touch on. There's also the issue that uh, the pandemic has got the likelihood of causing an increase in deaths due to HIV, estimated to be about 10% for HIV and TB, which is estimated about 20%. And these increases in deaths for HIV and TB related to COVID are essentially as a result of the disruption in health services. You can imagine with the COVID-19, especially in the early days, what we saw in the Northern Hemisphere, what was happening before COVID got to the Southern Hemisphere and our shores, we saw an environment where panic to some extent was created, uh, which was warranted, I thought, um, and in that, we saw the need for hospital services to prioritize COVID-19 at the time. So that means that any other services that were being provided were taking the back seat because of the burden on the health system that was brought about by COVID-19. This means that particularly for um, HIV in particular, the people who have HIV who are getting a, a, a treatment and care were no longer then able to access services because if you remember, uh, services were prioritized in the main for COVID-19, including in South Africa during the early days around April, May um, in our uh, trajectory with, the, with, the, with, with, with COVID-19. But beyond that, if you look at TB in particular, uh, it's been shown that uh, TB has been affected and this increase is usually also associated with the fact that in the early days, people are, uh, we are not, are not able to access services. So we are not able to diagnose people early enough so that we can put them on treatment and then we can prevent them from dying. So there are different aspects this for both HIV and TB. Now, if you look at uh, um, uh, in South Africa, in terms of uh, what has been happening to TB notifications over the past uh, six months from January to June, uh, since the time of COVID, it's been coming down at a bit. Um, if, you, if, if, if you look particularly around uh, the curve, which is not something that we want because then uh, since we do have an epidemic of TB in South Africa, then the consequences are going to be dire. Of most importance is the fact that COVID-19 has up to date uh, led to the death of over 1 million people. Um, and we know that TB uh, in the last year killed 1.4 million people. So you can see that, uh, uh, that it's a serious disease. We cannot take it lightly. While HIV and the deaths related to HIV are about 700,000. Or so. so this is these three diseases are important and we need to do something about them. Um, we have some studies have been done in South Africa, especially in the Western Cape, that have shown a clear link between COVID-19, TB, and HIV, as far especially around the severity of the disease. So there's a clear demonstration of this. We do also find from information produced by the NIOH that uh, those who have comorbidities um, and who are affected by COVID-19 include people with TB and HIV. So the next logical question, which we all have to grapple with when we go to our workplaces is, why are we bothered about this? Um, uh, what does the workplace have to do with this? Are, are these occupational diseases? I mean, if I am working for a financial institution, 
And um, um, I know for a fact that within the work processes, there's nothing that leads to exposure to HIV or exposure to COVID or exposure to TB. Why should we be worried about this? Are these occupational diseases? So the first thing to note is that an occupational disease is any disease contracted primarily as a result of an exposure to a hazard or a risk uh, um, in your workplace. Um, and, and, and that would lead to that particular disease. And we should be also mindful of the time factor that there should be the exposure before the disease. Um, in South African terms, uh, we get our definition uh, more strongly from the COID Act, uh, which says that it's a disease that has arisen out of and in the cause of your employment. So it's very clear what an occupational disease is. And if you take the South African experience, we can confidently say that these three diseases, depending on the industry that you work in, they could be occupational diseases. But it's not in all the industries that you work in that they are going to be occupational diseases. But also, while they are not going to be occupational diseases in all the industries that you work in, the workplace still has a role to play because these are diseases of public health importance. And because they are diseases of public health importance, the workplace will be affected one way or the other. Now, I thought before I go very far, I should emphasize this slide, which relates to organized labor party, in, in particular uh, trade unions in the workplace and the role they have to play around in these three diseases. Trade unions are a key partner in planning any response in the workplace because they look out for workers' rights and in South African terms, not only do they work, look out for workers' rights, but any response that is related to occupational health in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, it is law that you should consult and have agreement about your program with organized labor. So it's also a compliance issue, but it's also important for the trade unions to know about this because they need to negotiate the terms of work and negotiate a safe working environment for their uh, uh, members, um, but they also need to participate in improving the occupational health services in your workplace. And of course, create awareness and advocacy around issues. And TB and, 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 and COVID, we know that these are diseases that are dependent also um, on their control in the workplace on issues of uh, 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 compliance by workers. So if you are working with trade unions, you will go very far. Now, I want to take us through um, what a, a health program in the workplace would look like. And this is a very comprehensive health program. And uh, I must acknowledge Sasom and Dr. Greg Yu, uh, who conceptualized this program. Um, with, with this, essentially, what we are uh, seeing is that in the workplace, you have primarily four limbs that you need to look at to have a, a comprehensive workplace program. And it's important to see this because it will tell, tell us what is it that workers can expect in the workplace as part of the law as it relates to COVID-19, HIV, and TB. So the first place to start um, of all these programs that, that are there in terms of occupational health and safety, we can confidently say that workers are expecting to get the first limb, which is occupational health program. Within that program, they will expect that a workplace will have health risk plan and a health risk assessment done. And it will include other things, including medical surveillance around there. So this is what you would expect by law for an occupational health program in the workplace. Now, seeing that we are talking about COVID-19 today, um, uh, how is COVID-19 uh, affected or being shown to be part of this? Uh, well, the three diseases, if you look at the four limbs, number one, when you do your risk assessment in the workplace, you may or may not find that any of them are going to be a hazard that you need to manage. If you look at COVID, we know for a fact that for health workers, 
it is going to be a hazard that you're going to need to manage. But we also know that while it is not brought about by the procedures in the workplace, you will also find COVID in the workplaces um, that are not necessarily um, bringing it uh, because of the work that is happening, but because of people interacting with the communities and coming with COVID to the workplace. So it still becomes something that you have to think about and look at how you are managing it. You could manage this through your medical surveillance program, which I'm not gonna get into great detail, but I also want to say for programs that where these are not occupational diseases, you may find that it is important under your primary health care program, even when you do not have your primary health care program, you may have a, an education program where you will be expected because these are public health diseases of importance and you may be expected that you have to participate in improving the conditions in the country or the region where you are by providing education on these triple burden uh, of diseases. Also, you have to uh, provide information on diseases of lifestyle because the workplace does not exist in isolation, it exists within society. And within that society, it must participate in a meaningful way. And you may also look at these three diseases as part of the things that you may do, not necessarily because the law demands that you do so, but because you're thinking of your social responsibility as well. And not forgetting the fact that in the environments where COVID-19, HIV, and TB have been declared by the Department of Employment and Labor, in particular as occupational diseases, we need to go through the processes of the COIT and administering and, and submitting for compensation people who are affected by these diseases. So I think what we have seen here is that in a comprehensive workplace, there is good enough reason why we should have a COVID-19 and HIV and TB disease program within a workplace. But we are mindful of the fact that not all workplaces will have comprehensive programs like what we saw Dr. Mampa presenting from Impala, for example. So seeing that that is the case, we do, however, um, expect that each workplace will work towards having basic occupational health services. What are basic occupational health services? Essentially, this is a service for the protection of people's health when they are at work. And it should be based on scientifically sound and socially acceptable methods. And it is, takes the principle that you should, on an incremental way, work towards having the best services. So it could start where you have a very small um, enterprise, uh, probably with 10 people, it could start with just having somebody who is a safety officer on top of what they are doing in that particular workplace, who from time to time might find information and share with everyone or share in what is commonly called the toolbox. But we do uh, try and advocate that uh, medium enterprises work towards what we call this basic, where you will have some basic infrastructure as well as some human resources um, at a very, very, very low level in terms of their availability. You may have a, a nurse coming in um, in particular days, or you may have a doctor coming in in particular days, assist you. As your company grows, we expect that you will also grow um, the services for occupational health say, services within your particular workplace. Now, as you organize your services for your workplace, the WHO advises that any service for it to work, you need at a minimum these six pillars. And those six pillars that uh, we are looking at is that there must be a policy because the policy will tell you the intent and will give you the commitment from the management and it will be something that is enforceable by law but then you must provide the service. So you must be able to organize your service in a way that is meaningful. Some people organize their service in different ways. You could have an external service provider, you could have an in-house service provider, or you could have a mixture of the, of, of the above. But you, very important is that you should have the right human resources and the fact that you cannot have the system or the services unless you have thought about who's going to pay for what and when. 
In occupational health, it's usually very clear because the employer is liable for this. And you must have the right resources in your workplace and be able to utilize information for improving the service that you give to your workers. So just looking at each one of these and taking the context of South Africa, we know that in South Africa, Department of Employment and Labor is providing the policy direction overall in that it has provided the law in terms of Occupational Health and Safety Act of 1993. And over and above that, it has provided for um, the hazardous biological agents regulations, which are supporting that law, which cover both, um, I mean, the three diseases that we are talking about. So even in the absence of anything else, you would still have that and you should be able to do something in terms of, of that. So we see that there is leadership from the government in a way, but beyond the department, um, there's also the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, which also operate specifically in the mining industry. Um, and, and this law also provides the Mine Health and Safety Act in particular, um, and it provides a lot of uh, regulations which assist with managing uh, diseases in that space. Of course, all these departments are working with the Department of Health as the key department when it comes to health issues. Uh, as you can see, in particularly in this, uh, what I've added here, the Department of Health is producing on a regular basis documents that will assist with COVID-19, which are available on the NIOH website. But for coordination, it is important that the stakeholders are identified and they all work. So you need the employer to be on board, you need the trade unions to be on board, you need civil society to participate, and that happens through NETLEC. Um, and, and a lot of what is happening around COVID-19 now is done through NETLEC. And we know that in the past, a lot of what happened around the HIV was done through NETLEC. So it's important to think about that. So in South Africa, as things stands, we have the policy direction, we have the leadership from all the stakeholders, from business to organized labor and government and civil society. But you cannot just rely on the laws that are produced by government. You have to take those laws and then you have to customize them to your work environment and have your own policy in your work environment, which is going to say, what is it that you're going to provide to your employees? Because if you have your own policy, this will ensure that there is top management commitment in your workplace, but it will also make sure that you get the resources that you require. So do not just rely only on the national laws, have specific policies in your workplace related to COVID-19, HIV and TB management in the workplace. As far as service provision, uh, when we are talking about service provision, uh, I always advise that you must always divide them at least into three parts. The first part is what we would call within the space of occupational health and uh, public health as primary prevention. In other words, meaning that you prevent the disease before it occurs. For example, when we had early, in, I mean, late in December, early January, that um, the WHO has identified this impending pandemic that was coming, that's when you need to make sure that these systems are in place. In occupational health, you always have to start with a risk assessment. Your risk assessment should be able to help you um, identify the hazard if it exists from COVID-19, HIV, and TB, and it should be able to tell you what you have in place as controls and what you probably need to improve as controls. And all of that can go into your plan going forward. And I'm emphasizing this plan because this plan should talk to your control measures. And in, from the form of occupational health, you know, we know the five levels of control measures, which I'm not going to talk about today. Um, uh, so I'm not gonna mention again, issues related that you must eliminate the hazard, you must substitute the hazard, or you must put in engineering controls or ventilation or administrative controls. And finally, PPE, I'm not, we're not, we're not gonna dwell on that too much today. 
because of time, but all of those are the control measures that you need to think about and you need to follow the, that systematic way for responding to each one of these diseases when you produce your plan. But most important is to set up your health and safety committee. And now this is important for all three diseases, particularly in South Africa, we have the direction that is produced by the Department of Employment and Labor, uh, which the COVID-19, the comprehensive COVID-19 direction, which is law, which is specific about resuscitating and having health and safety committees in place, which is going to assist with uh, approving your plans in the workplace. So it's very important that we do this. I cannot overstress the importance of communication, education and training of workers on COVID-19, HIV and TB and the link between the diseases. This is also important because remember, some of the prevention mechanisms for COVID apply to TB. And in some instances, because we are in South Africa and we have the added problem of TB, some of the basic interventions that are advocated for for COVID might, might not apply because in the same environment, you could have TB in that space. If you think about in particular, respiratory protection. So the protection for TB might mean something else specifically in the health sector. You also have to think about utilizing vaccines and prophylaxis, vaccines particularly, uh, if you are thinking about COVID-19, we are all, including the government of South Africa, the experts in South Africa, and the international groupings are saying that everybody should have access to the influenza vaccine because it makes it easier to manage COVID-19. Um, of course, people with HIV, you have to think about INH prophylaxis for TB in particular. We are all struggling and we are all are unable to manage the behavior of workers in workplaces as far as adhering to the control measures. And this calls for intentionally creating a health promotion program that is going to work towards behavior change in your workplace. Of course, once you have done that, and once the diseases are there, you go, you move on to secondary prevention, which is detecting the diseases and treating them quite early uh, when you can still halt or stop their progress. And this you can do through your programs for medical surveillance. What Dr. Mampa was talking about would be very much also in this grouping. But what I want to emphasize is that for all three diseases, the law in South Africa demands that you do screening in the workplace. All of us have been informed, particularly around COVID-19, that when we come to the workplace in the morning, we should screen the employer has got the responsibility that we are screened. So that is something that we are not always doing in many workplaces. We need to be careful about that because that could be the way that the virus is going to enter your workplace and create a problem of you exposing most of your workers to the particular uh, 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 virus. But this is also important because, you know, in some instances, TB might present in similar ways. So if you do the one, you are able to uh, 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 be able to deal with the other disease. Of course, the workplace must think about how to manage sick and special leave and make sure that we do not uh, put employees, particularly in a disadvantage, uh, but we oblige with the law in South Africa as far as managing sick leave related to COVID-19 um, uh, as well as uh, other issues. Because we have COVID-19 now, we have been told and we have seen in practice that the people with HIV and TB are actually vulnerable to the severe consequences of COVID. And this is important because it's not the risk of getting COVID that increases when you have HIV and TB, but it is the risk of severe disease once you have COVID-19. So we need to be managing that very carefully and be planning for it in line with the law and, and, and also not abuse the system because it is intended for the well-being of the workplace as well, as well as society. And of course, we must 
always, always think about in the event when there has been somebody with COVID-19, we must always do an incident-based risk assessment and also be able to decide whether there would be a need or there wouldn't be a need for workplace closures. Of course, employees must have access to employee wellness programs, especially around mental health during this time. For all these diseases, it would be very important. Um, I'm not gonna say much around tertiary prevention, that is after people have the diseases, either one of these diseases, but what is important, which we do not talk about in, in the most, is that we have to start opening the debate around incapacity, because there is going to be colleagues that may not be able to return to the workplace. I know for at the moment uh, where you can work from, the, uh, from home, we are supposed to give that opportunity to people so that we keep them employed. But for those who cannot, and if the risk of COVID-19 remains, what are we going to do? We do not want to wait until there is labor relations issues between trade unions and employers. Let's think in advance how we're going to manage this. Of course, we do not want to put or push people into poverty. So we, this should be managed in a manner that is uh, very sensitive to all the interests, intricacies that are around this issue. I'm not gonna say much about uh, human resources, except that with every program, for it to succeed, you need the right human resources. And it's not always going to be. I know that we are very keen to uh, always employ human resources without thinking about the impact on the overall organization. So as people who are managing health services, we also have to think about the impact on the bigger organization when we make decisions. As for example, if you take now, there's a requirement for a compliance officer and early in the early days, many people were thinking that there should be somebody new coming from outside that is employed around this. This will affect your occupational health service because then employers will feel overburdened. So you have to try and work and integrate your human resources so that they can give you the product. And in this instance, if you look at the list that is put up, it's the same human resources that are are necessary for a comprehensive occupational health program other than just HIV, TB, and COVID-19. Of course, infrastructure. Um, this, I thought I should just raise two things that are important I would like you to take home with, is number one, with COVID-19, when you read the law in particular, there's a section there where it says, uh, if somebody is in the workplace and then um, they are uh, uh, exhibiting symptoms, they must be isolated. And many people are interpreting this to mean every workplace must now develop an extra room so that they can put people there. My interpretation of, of the law is that that is not necessarily the case, but what the law is saying is that employees must be put in a safe environment where they will not be a risk to themselves and others in the workplace. So you must be able to show that. So you must not just, when you're recommending to your workplaces and your employers be in a position where you are not showing that you are thinking about the impact on the organization as a whole as you provide this. But I also wanted to say that we live in an age where information systems are mandatory in my opinion. So we need to think about that and making sure that we set up systems to manage our occupational health services. And of course, you need to have sound and reliable information because you need that to make decisions about your workplace under the current environment for all the diseases that I've spoken about. And you need to get your information in the right places. And I'm, I'm glad that Ashraf has been sharing a lot of information on the chat. And some of that information is that information, reliable information is available from the NIOH website and other credible institutions. Um, we should move away from getting information from unreliable sources, which I will not name. But you must also use the information that you collect from your workplace to monitor your own program and make sure that you make decision to improve your own program in your workplace. Your information must be utilized. The information that you collect in your workplace, you must use that information to act in your 
local environment. Of course, there is requirements to report to regulatory bodies like the Department of Employment and Labor, the National Department of Health. And we know for COVID in particular, you have to report to the National Institute for Occupational Health. So you do need a system to collect and use information in your own workplace. What is key for me is that do not start things afresh and then end up with silos. We have an HIV program in the workplace that is not talking to the TB program in the workplace that is not talking to the COVID-19. Try as much to integrate your programs and be mindful of the fact that your programs need to always expect that there will be emerging and re-emerging diseases as we move forward. Just want to emphasize that when we talk in these platforms, we always forget the informal economy. And these are the people who are also affected by TB, HIV, and COVID-19, and who are also affected by the social consequences of these diseases when they are in their workplaces. So it is crucial that in planning, we think about how then are we going to provide a service to this particular population. And with that, I'd like to thank the NHLS, the NIOH, and the University of Pretoria. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Mzumkulu Zungu, the head of the HNTV in the Workplace Unit within the National Institute for Occupational Health. And as you've heard, um, he is a joint appointment between University of Pretoria and the NIOH. And Dr. Zungu has covered the key topic of occupational health services, the essential uh, um, center or place uh, and tool within the workplace where the professionals can provide the critical support for workers who require that, especially where the triple burden of COVID-19, TB and HIV is a, a reality. So we are now going to go for the question on the session and immediately I want to hand over to Dr. Mampa. There is a question from Vongani Mavuma and he wanted to know about a particular abbreviation, I IRIS, but I would assume that you'll probably give him an answer within the context, um, Dr. Mampa, of the overall presentation you've provided. So if you could just unmute your microphone and um, and just uh, address uh, that particular question. Go ahead. Um, that is immune reconstitution syndrome. Um, what happens in HIV is that um, people tend to have uh, a low immune response, meaning that in a normal healthy individual, your own body can fight against any type of infection when it settles in, when it sits in. But in an HIV individual, they are immune compromised, meaning that their CD4 count is low, but the viral load is high. And because of that, when TB sits in, for example, into the body, their own body is unable to amount an immune response to fight against the HIV. So what then happens is when you start treating the TB, the body then starts to re uh, wake up and recall and say, no, but there is an alien in my body that I have to fight against. And now your body, it was weak with low immunity, now you give a TB treatment, the body starts to fight, but the HIV itself also starts to fight in a different way. Then when that happens, it becomes more like a, of a macrophage, a macrophage tumor necrosis factor, the same type of things that happens with the cytokine storm, where now you have macrophages destroying your own, your own body immunity. And when that happens, then um, we call that whole process of that tumor necrosis factor interleukin-6 coming out, the same process that happens with the cytokine storm, we call it uh, immune reconstitution syndrome. During that time, when your body is starting to, its immunity is starting to build, the resistance coming together, together that tug of war in the body is more of a resistant type of a, of a war your body gets weak, your body is unable to fight. What happens, your immunity goes further along down, down. it goes 
it, it goes down. And then what happens is you can develop disseminated TB. You can develop disseminated cryptococcus and meningitis. That's why in HIV, in HIV treatment, we say when you treat an individual who's newly diagnosed HIV positive for TB, you always initiate the treatment, the TB treatment first. You wait two weeks or more before you initiate the R treatment. If you initiate the R treatment, that risk, that cytokine inter interleukin storm that happens will, will, will reactivate and you have a greater chance of losing your patient. Because I did mention the interleukin-6 causes multiple organ failure. Already your HIV positive low immunity, already your kidney is failing. So now you have that immune reconstitution um, a syndrome happening, your cytokine storm building, you will eventually have a very sick patient that might deteriorate and die. So that is called immune reconstitution syndrome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Mampa. Uh, there's a question by Matsudisho, um, and uh, Matsudisho is asking about inviting, I guess, GEMS would be the government employee's medical um, scheme to workplace for health risk assessment, including TB and HIV. With COVID issues of social distancing and other related matters, should we continue with our previous plan? Or what will be your recommendations? And I open that up to everybody. Perhaps, Dr. Zungu, you want to start off on that particular question? By Matsudiso. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I think the most important thing here is that we all have to, in all workplaces, have to be mindful of protecting um, the employees, protecting the visitors and clients that are coming to our premises. And all of this will mean that our risk assessment should be able to inform us that what would be the impact of bringing people to our premises. And then based on that risk assessment, you'll be able to say, should you be bringing gems or should you not be bringing gems? The onus in terms of the law is the responsibility, I mean, is still with the employer to make sure that they do the appropriate risk assessment to protect workers and others in that particular environment. So you cannot use COVID-19 to say you are unable to comply with the law because GEMS is not coming. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Zungu. And so that was the last open question we had um, and it was answered live. So um, the, uh, the list of questions that we've had that have been answered to all three of our um, presenters, uh, what are the sort of main trends there amongst the questions? And if you would, would you like to address any of those trends now, as well as any sort of additional comments you have, overarching critical comments you want our audience to leave with um, as important messages for their roles they are playing within their workplaces around this particular question. Um, so Piwe, could I start with you? Yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Um, I think when I, when I looked at the trends and what we picked up from the questions, they actually reflect how this webinar was organized. We, we, we had a significant number of clinical questions, but also there were some socioeconomic related kind of questions. And I think this is the part that sometimes is not looked at. And I want to quickly reflect on a question that was asked in relation to the involvement of informal economy. And, and, and I think the answer really resonates with your socioeconomic aspects. And thank you, Francis, for asking this question and um, linking it to the very last slide of Dr. Zungu, because the informal economy is actually more than 60% of the world's employed population. And this is about 2 billion workers. So we cannot ignore um, the, the relevance of informal economy here. And I do want to reiterate that the issue of social dialogue is so important because if we don't engage or involve or allow the informal economy to participate, then we will um, be missing the point. South Africa, yes, is a little advanced compared to other countries because South Africa, unlike other countries, 
they have four constituents at NEDLAC. And the fourth one is the community. And the community is the one that is recognizing and allowing informal economy operators to air and voice their concerns. And elsewhere, it's the traditional tripartite arrangement. And it makes it difficult for the informal economy to voice some of the challenges they are faced with. So I think the issue of social dialogue uh, program director is also very important because this is where policies are formed. This is where policies are revised, similarly to what South Africa has produced, the new directions by the Department of Employment and Labor, uh, which were promulgated early in October. Over to you, Program Director. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps from your side, Dr. Mampa, um, I think you've given quite a lot of very practical clinical experience that you shared with people. And there were certain key aspects of the cases that you shared. Are, are there specific messages around those cases and how our audience and our attendees in their different workplaces depending on the, on the different roles they play, should keep in mind in supporting the employees. Thank you, over to you. Thank you very much. I think it's very important to heed what, uh, what Professor Zungu said, especially about doing a health risk assessment on, 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 on the premises that you are working at, and also ensuring that you do primary prevention, which is screening of employees. And I just forgot to mention earlier that we had screened around 4.4, uh, we actually conducted 4.4 million screening uh, of individuals, even though we have 40,000 individuals, you can imagine that when they go to work in the morning, we screen them, when they leave work, we screen them, and, and we have conducted around 17,000 tests. But of that screening, it is where we actually picked up these individuals who presented the symptoms of COVID-19. They were actually going to work. And because they were going to work, to them, they felt that they were all right. There was nothing happening with them. But in actual fact, through the screening, we were able to pick up that no, they're coughing, no, the temperature is high. And that plain cough, I remember we had a, quite a debate at the beginning of it, because now, our nurses from the shafts that were screening the individuals were sending everybody with just a mere cough to the hospital for us to assess. And we used to fight about it. And then it stemmed out from there that some of those individuals that are actually coughing coming from the shafts do actually, when we do x-rays, we find out that they actually have pneumonia and we have, it, we have to exclude TB on them. So screening, it's, it's, it's very, very vital um, to, this, to this. The other most important, um, important aspect that I would want to put across is that, you know, when you are confronted with a COVID positive patient, they always have in um, underlying uh, medical conditions, especially this time we're talking about HIV and TB. Now, uh, Professor Zungu spoke about, um, you know, um, assessing uh, uh, your, your employees. At Impala, we did a desktop, uh, desktop assessment of vulnerable employees, HIV positive, diabetes, hypertension. And that way we knew was immune compromised, who needed our immediate attention, whom we needed to focus on. And we're able to focus and channel on those particular employees. And also what uh, Mr. Simpio has spoke about, he spoke about uh, looking at accommodating people and see whether can they not actually work from home. Most of the people at the mine who have been found to have diabetes and together with HIV have been accommodated and they're actually working at home. So there are a lot of aspects that we actually have to concentrate on, not only on treatment of the individual, important to get the diagnosis of TB and HIV, and make sure that even in COVID-19 patients, we exclude TB. I was quite worried at the beginning of COVID and I was worried that my nurses and doctors were going to miss TB. And as, as what um, Mr. Simpu spoke about, that there's going to be, who actually said there'll be, a, I think it's a 20% increase in TB deaths because of COVID, because now we'll be focusing on COVID and forgetting that TB is there. So the message is, like we have been doing. We have an integrated TB and HIV program. COVID, 
I call it just the cherry on top. Search for the TB in your patients. TB will kill the patients if they are not treated, especially when they have COVID. If you miss the diagnosis of TB, the patients will definitely die. So let us continue the hard work. And I think South Africa, we've actually done a very good, uh, we have actually, you know, come down from very high incidence uh, rates of TB and we've actually done very well. So thank you very much. Let's continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mampa. Uh, Dr. Zungu, um, there's, there's uh, your input and, and um, overall sort of um, observations of trend of questions and key messages, but could I just also direct um, Dudu Nkosi, unfortunately, has typed her question in the chat box, but I'm going to read it from there. Um, uh, Dudu asks, um, is temperature measuring still a valid and important way of screening? So if I could just uh, put that to, to you, Dr. Zungu. Thank you, um, 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 uh, program director. Um, just to say that, uh, you know, in the response to COVID-19, um, it is a comprehensive response. Um, while in terms of the official advisory, um, the screening is primarily based on four key questions. Um, and the temperature uh, screening is one of the things that you could add to strengthen your program. I just want to um, uh, also add that, you know, as human beings, it's only natural that we always try and do the things that seem less strenuous and less compre I mean, less difficult. Uh, if you take, for example, a lot of people now are doing temperature screenings everywhere you go in South Africa. But actually, whatever is happening everywhere you go in South Africa cannot be taken as very successful, in my opinion, because the quality assurance of many of these things, where you walk in into a shop, somebody points something at you, and they tell you that your temperature is a certain way, has been found not to always be consistent. So the temperature screening is not the most important. Uh, in studies that were done early on in the epidemic, it was found that um, the screening missed um, more than 50% of people who were found to come in, especially at airports ar across the world. So that was a big problem. Um, and and it, temperature screening is not the main thing that we should be dealing with. So we must be doing this as a comprehensive uh, assessment. And uh, when we sp I presented just now, I spoke about um, um, getting equipment and appropriate equipment, it also talks to that, that you cannot just go buy something that's gonna tell somebody that they have a temperature of 35.1 and you accept it as, a, as appropriate and you move on because clearly that means that there's no quality assurance there. Mm. But Thank you very much. Please proceed, carry on. Yeah, but uh, overall, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm I think that the message I, I was trying to put across is that you must always think systematic in what you do as far as providing the services in your workplace. And it's important that services are formalized so that they can be catered for in budgets in your workplace. And always think about um, providing a platform for those who are, do not have a voice to be able to speak about the health in the workplace. Just to touch on this question on Quadi, uh, which is about spiral testing. Well, spiral testing now is, uh, is now uh, uh, through, um, uh, um, the, the, in South Africa is, is now open because the, the, it has been found that uh, um, uh, this, through the Respiratory Association, I think, I forget which, I think it's the Respiratory Association of South Africa. They have released a statement that uh, you can consider using Spiro now, but you must be very careful in making sure that you do not spread the virus while doing that. So if you can just Google on that, you'll get more information around that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zungu. Um, so uh, a quick question. There's one about infection through the eyes. I'm clearly going to uh, redirect uh, um, this particular attendee, I think it's William, um, to 
look at some of the earlier webinars we have done. And if the information on the website is not adequate amongst the frequently asked questions as well, please direct your question to info at nih.ac.za. That is info um, at nioh.ac.za. Um, and so that would also apply, I think, to you, Anonymous. Um, you've been very active. Thank you for your questions. Uh, is it still necessary to put a question of asking travel history in screening tools? Um, I'm going to just ask you because we have now run out of time and I will be not be able to ask our um, uh, presenters and panelists to give you a specific answer there. I'm going to encourage you, Anonymous, just to direct uh, your question to the email address that is info at nih.ac.za. Um, Sharon, sorry, we won't be able to deal with that very detailed case study that you've just shared with us, but thank you for sharing it. So at this point in time, I need to thank all our presenters. Um, firstly, starting with uh, uh, Sampiwe Mbele, Mabele uh, from the International Labour Organization. Thank you, Sampiwe, for your contributions. Much appreciated to this very important topic as, as part of the evolving list of topics covered by the NIH um, as COVID-19 webinars. Thank you, Sampiwe. And then our um, second presenter, that's Dr. Irene Mampa from Impala Platinum Mine, um, dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on HIV and TB, the clinical aspects. Thank you very much. Uh, might encourage you, Dr. Mampa, just to look at Sharon Alphonse's question there. She, she might perhaps uh, benefit from your input. If you could type something uh, before we shut down the session, that'll be great. Alternatively, maybe um, you could offer an answer as well there. But thank you very much for your contribution. Much appreciated. And then finally, our acting executive director, that's uh, Dr. Mzumkulu Zungu, who's the head of the um, TB HIV in the workplace unit within the NIH. Thank you very much for your contributions, as well as our list of panelists. Um, and that included um, uh, Dr. Tanusha Singh, uh, Nosemilo Manchleni, Langeni, apologies. Uh, my tongue got twisted there a little bit. Apologies, Nosimilo, and then uh, Dr. Oded Valmink as well um, for your contributions towards the panel. I know earlier on, um, Dr. Um, Janet Manganye had also contributed uh, as part of the panel. With that having said, I thank you all for joining us today in this webinar. Please, it is quite clear what our roles are back in the workplace on this particular topic. We've got to uh, increase our efforts and we wish you strength in your interventions within your workplace around the triple burden of COVID-19, HIV, and TB in the workplace. So thank you, go well, stay safe, and um, yes, uh, keep take care of yourselves, your fellow employees, and your families. Goodbye. <laughs>